on in government contracts and hiring. I want to talk about this because of the drama that we've had recently, both here in Lagos and at the federal level. Here we have the issue of Loma, their contractors and the street sweepers who say that they've not been paid. And Loma says the contractors have been underpaying the sweepers. And then at the federal level, we have the 774,000 jobs drama. The Labour Ministry and the National Assembly quarreled about how it should be supervised and who should select the workers. In fact, it's now on pause, Zef. And that brings me to today's uh, big hard fact. Transparency International last year ranked Nigeria 146th out of 180 nations on its Corruption Perceptions Index. So that means that only 36 countries were perceived as more corrupt than Nigeria. Now, corruption is in all sectors of Nigerian life, but today we're going to look at government. Last week, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Friday? No, Thursday, sorry. Last week, Thursday, we looked at it with business, corruption in business, with that entrepreneurial uh, story that I shared with you. But today, let's look at the government. That's your favorite subject. And not just any part of government. We're looking at procurement and hiring. Just like the two cases that I mentioned earlier on, we're going to look at how these processes work, how they get corrupted, and how we can make them more transparent. And here to talk to me about it is the founder and CEO of Budget, Sheung Onigbinde. Thank you so much for joining us again on Hard Fact, Sheung. Thank you so much, Sandra. It's a pleasure being here today. I yes. also have a former M&E consultant, both for various governments and the World Bank, Chief Andy Obofaribo. Thank you so much for joining us, Chief. Always good to be here, Sandra. All right. And I also want to hear from you, Lagos, because you are my most important guest. I always say that. You are my most important guest. So please uh, talk to us as we have this conversation. Talk about your experiences with government contracts. Have you ever gotten a, a contract from the government? Have you ever uh, bidded for a contract from the government? Um, uh, have you ever been part of a government recruitment exercise? How do you think those things can be improved? How do you think they can be made more transparent? Let's have that conversation today on the show. Let's start with a basic question. Uh, Ashel, why does government choose to hire contractors to do jobs instead of relying on direct labor? I mean, you, you are touching a very difficult and sensitive topic today. <laughs> and maybe I could advise you to get yourself extra security uh, at the end of this show. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> Because, I mean, uh, there's a whole economy around it. It's called tender preneurs. I mean, that's why we joke we did it in budget. It's called what? Um, tender preneurs. Tender, tender preneurs. Ah. I, I, if you're going to put it in the town, you call it tender preneurship. Tender know? preneurship. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and, and you would say, so there's a cycle of expectations, um, which is, the government as is, it believes that, and I, I don't believe everything should go through the same wheel of contracting, mm -hmm. but you have a project with a life cycle mm -hmm. and you have contracted someone to do it. Mm -hmm. We believe that there should be a fair process in terms of, um, in terms of making the right, the choice mm -hmm. of who, who finally becomes a contractor. You believe that there will be milestones. Mm -hmm. Which means you 30% you're paid, 40% you're paid. 100% you're paid. And I think when you have a, pro a project that is guided by a milestones, then it is, it is important for government to be able to put a contracting element behind that. Mm. And also because it's, it is, these, are, these are public funds, so you also have to make sure that the process is inclusive and is fair to all concerned. The part I struggled with always all the time is the procurement of goods. You want to buy a car, you want to buy a new lot van. Why does it have to be procurement? Why don't you just walk straight down to the to the Toyota shop and procure vans for you know, for the government. And why do we have to? I mean, and things like that. Where I struggle with. Why well, I believe that public contract is important, uh, mm. considering also how, and also let us not forget that it's also a catalyst to to improve the money supply within the system. I mean, so you have people also are, are benefiting from the entire chain. Mm. Employment is connected to it. The people's livelihoods are connected to it. So I, I think it's also very very important. Mm -hmm. uh, Chief of uh, why does government choose to hire contractors to do jobs instead of relying on direct labor? I, I'm curious to hear what you say to that. <laughs> well, 
um, on paper, mm. um, they will say, <laughs> on paper, they will tell you that, uh, you know, um, the private sector is more efficient than the public sector. Mm. They will tell you that, uh, <laughs> they will tell you that um, it's more cost efficient on paper mm. for government to hand the job over to, um, you know, to a company who specializes in it. Oh, mm. government wants to build a road and mm. get a, you know, company that can build roads, mm. you know, don't, you know, you want to build railway, get railway builders, right? And, mm. Um, of course, you know, the private sector is supposed to be more, um, you know, profit sensitive, cost sensitive. So they'll, they'll, they'll keep costs down. Mm. And then there's also the, the idea that um, it's better to bring on these um, companies when there is a project than to have government, like, you know, public labor, like, you know, have government hire people who are on the payroll year round and will not be used to their full capacity unless they are, they are projects. So these are all some of the things that they say are the reasons why, um, you know... Now, 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 there's one thing... It's one thing to say one thing, but is the system working e efficiently, Chief of Verbal? We seem to have a situation where uh, contracts don't get executed even when contractors are paid. We also have inflation of the value of the contract. So again... Is the system any better, Chief? Uh, well, I think you've already answered the question. Uh, <laughs> the, it, it's not... <laughs> I mean, okay, let me put it this way. Like, I'm from the Niger Delta, mm -hmm. and uh, you have an, uh, you know, you have an agency like the NDDC, the Niger Delta Development Commission, mm -hmm. which appears to inflate contracts for a living. Mm. You know, you have, you know... <laughs> Something wow, like, <laughs> that's a loaded uh, comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean... I mean, NDDC wants to build like a five classroom block. Mm. And okay, we have. Well, we're in Nigeria after all, so the network is going to do as networks in Nigeria do. Yeah. But. Uh, <laughs> But uh, let, let me come over to you. Um, so we, we, we have Chief Oboforo telling us that um, contracts in Nigeria are typically inflated or agreeing with me that they're typically inflated. If we have this inefficiency going on, uh, uh, um, why have we not decided to go the other, uh, other route, Show. I mean, um, like you said, on paper, I mean, people say private sector elements are the most important uh, vehicle, mm. um, vehicle and to, you know, to deliver public services. Mm. I mean, to say, okay, we're going to get a school built. We can't say well, government is going to hire bricklayers or hire um, quantity surveyors. We're going to contract that for the private mm. sector to mm -hmm. deliver. Mm -hmm. But once you get, it means that you get an incestuous, apologies of using that word, relationship <laughs> between the private sector and the public sector. Mm. So they are all bonded together. They are all connected together. And this is not just something that is unique to Nigeria. I mean, mm. Brazil also had this um, head-shaking situation that he actually removed uh, Yuma Rousseff, who mm. was their former uh, prime minister, from office just because you had the petroleum company was also round tripping contracts within a few people, mm. and that was coming at, at an inflated cost. So it's a situation everywhere. But what you get in Nigeria is that it's brazen, it's without limits. And also, it's become a, a free-for-all kind of situation. Mm. And I'll show you one few examples of where you get. For example, there was a time, recently we did an FOI request to the National Human Rights Commission, mm -hmm. the NHR, mm -hmm. uh, asking for the delivery of certain constituency projects. Okay. Now, when we got the response back from the NHR, you would find out that there were, part of the constituency project was sensitization of people or their human rights. Mm. And you'd be shocked that as a telecoms company, you know, it was a telecoms company that was delivering sensitization on human rights. And so, I'm, I'm going to ask, and you begin to check the organization, look at all the organizations that are delivering results. I mean, like, what exactly does this have to do hmm. with public contracting? It's become just a box ticking exercise. And that's why a Nigerian procurement system is not easy. Hmm. Anybody that has been through it will know you need to bring an arm and a leg to be able to do procurement with government. <laughs> and what that is done, the complexity has created some level of exclusivity. So there are just some few, and that's why I call it the tenderpreneurship economy. You know, just a few people 
who have become some some of there have been some incestuous uh, uh, relationship. They're working with the civil servants in government. They are the ones whose companies have checked all the boxes and they're able to submit all the documents and they're able to get all the contracts. And somehow the money is run trip within the civil service mm -hmm. or somehow is balkanized in a way that it gets across everybody. And that's why we don't see. The reason why Nigeria has failed to develop. You might talk about our productivity, you might talk about inadequate revenues. This is that even the little we have is wasted in a, in, a, in a significant way and that is so painful because we can't even get resources being built there was my I, where i live in Ibadan, there was a road being built there and they put a signpost there and he was said he was trying to do um a surfacing of the road and after a while there was rain there were rains for like three months the entire road is gone hmm. we question who approved this road who's checking the quality of this road? nobody is checking the quality of the road because not only does does procurement abuse no, so it doesn't, it doesn't, when even services are developed mm -hmm. and delivered mm -hmm. quality check is not done because you have you have collected part of the money so what moral right do you have to check that deliver the quality work and so the bane of nigeria the whole crisis of nigeria is all down to that people just steal public funds and the vehicle which they do it in a brazen way is to procurement and and then whatever you find and this is not just in 1999 it's been there even in the 60s i mean I mean, the Coca Commission within the Western region, you know, I mean, uh, the Foster Soton Tribunal. You see, all of that is all tied to politics, public service, and all tied to corporations. And everybody's just going into that arrangement with themselves. Mm. And somehow, what is being deprived is about the public good itself. Mm. Yeah. If you just joined the show, you're listening to Hard Facts on 99.3 Nigeria Info. How do we end corruption in government contracts and hiring? We have on the show the founder and CEO of Budget, Sean Igbinde. We also had uh, a former M&E consultant, both for various governments and the World Bank, Chief Andy Obofurbo. We're going to try and get him back on the line. He seems to be having network difficulties uh, connecting to the show. We're, we're continuing to try but um you keep saying that uh that's unavailable but show some people say that the inefficiency of our contracts uh system is a feature not a bug they say contracts are primarily a means of political patronage do you agree it is i mean it is and like doing that example even you know, right up to the 60s it is mm. You know, and that's what you get in Nigeria. People become sudden, um, sudden millionaires or sudden billionaires. Mm. I mean, someone is, uh, can't really feed last night, get a contract, contract, and he can now command choice properties, and that's what you get. I mean, um, and so where you have, I have someone in government, I have someone in public. That's always been about uh, now. I can have an access, you know, to the national game. Mm. And it's 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 not what it's supposed to be, mm. you know. And 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 when you have you know wrapped that around nepotism, mm -hmm. you know, when people who are qualified to to be able to to to, to sit in public offices, when you get when those will get offices, they have nothing else to offer. They have no ideas to offer. They have no policies to implement. Okay, let's you know, look at let's look at, let, let's look at specific let's look at specific cases, right? So you have the 774,000 job scheme. The federal government wants to run a public works program to keep people employed for three months due to COVID-19. But the National Assembly isn't satisfied with the selection process. They don't like the idea of the Ministry of Labor setting up state committees uh, uh, of stakeholders. They want the National Directorate of Employment to handle the recruitment directly. According to the laws and to best practice shown, what's the right way? The state uh, committee or the NDE? In the right way, it should be the NDE. That's what I suppose. That's what I, that's what I, I subscribe to. Um, the NDE, they are running a national special works program. And, and this is the problem, you know, um, because if it, where, where are we copying from? I mean, this is an idea I'm sure came from the from the when we had the when the U.S. was in depression. You know, there was a, a large scale public works program that was supposed to put people at work and supposed and it was meant to get them to be able to fend for their families. So we are creating some form of pride like that, maybe not at that scale, but to put that in the hands of the state government, I have reservations. 
extreme reservations. Hmm. So let there be a central organized. They can be state coordinating or state monitoring platforms that is able to work on monitoring of people to ensure that they show up for work and they deliver the right service and good. But I mean, balkanizing that and giving that to state money. And don't forget, what is that? What is at stake here? Everybody is trying to manage their interest. People in the National Assembly are not speaking out of benevolence of their spirit. It's not. It's just because when the whole thing gets to the state, when it gets to the state level, the level of control that you have, you know, as a state go as a as a legislator, or as a, I mean, as a senator, or as a House of Representatives, is limited. But what I think should be proper structure is let us empower institutions. We have the ND. We have been funding the ND. The people are there getting salaries. We have offices across the country in federal secretariats. Let these people do the job. Give them the people that you want them to do the public works. Set up a, a proper monitoring framework with it. But at the end of the day, everybody wants a cut. Everybody wants, I want 150 slots. I want 200 slots. I want 100 slots. Another retail kind of patronage at the end of the day. Nothing gets done in that way. Hmm. Now, um, we have people who have said, by the way, Lagos, I want to hear from you. Remember, I'm asking if you've ever tried to get a contract from the government, right? I want to hear about your own experience uh, with government contracts, you know, or with government job recruitment exercises. Have you tried to apply uh, for a, a government job? You know, have you tried to go through a uh, government's recruitment process? What was it like for you? How do you think these things can be improved? How do you think they can be made? more transparent how do we end corruption in government contracts and hiring 0700-993-993-993-0700-993-993-993-993 we've got henry on the line with us hello henry hello how are you what's your name uh henry of course go ahead <laughs> i'm henry from delta state yes henry oh henry from delta state good to have you on the show yeah. Yeah, yeah. The issue of the procurement, like you know, uh, the popular musician Fellas Nicola Power said, hmm. it is because of our party party system of government. The world practice, the rest of the world practice democracy, but Nigeria practice democracy. The government of some people by some people for some people. Democracy. So wow. Democracy. <laughs> That's a good now, one. The, the, the private sector that they so give this procurement and contract and all that, I do with some of the people. The government is not there for all of the people. They are there for some people, by some people, and for some people. So this is why this old corruption will never leave or they will go and practice democracy. The what we nickname democracy here in Nigeria is purely democracy. So that's why things are going the way they are going. Okay. It affects every facet of area in this country, both economic and otherwise. Okay. All right, Henry. Thanks for is, thanks yeah. thanks for teaching me a new word. Somocracy. I'll take one call from John. We have Chief Abufriba back on the line, and then we'll uh, continue the conversation. John, hello. Hello. Hi, John. Good to have you on the show. Yeah, Sandra. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, my name is John. Calling from Lekki. I know, John. Go ahead. Yeah, my I have been trying several times for applying for government, but it has not been easy for me. Okay. Because of the corruption and many other things we have in Nigeria here. Like me, now, I have tried to apply for Nigeria, I mean, like seven times. But it's, unfortunately, it's very bad. I cannot be able to make it. So, too much corruption is in this country. You have to work on ourselves. And work, have to work have, on have, our you, have, you, have you paid money for any of the government um, uh, jobs that you try to apply for? No, I've not paid, any, I've not paid money to anybody. But the problem is that if you have connection, they'll ask you to pay, for, uh, pay money before you get into it. But if you don't have anybody to connect you, hmm. that's the Ah, I see. So he's talking about nepotism, a concept that Sean mentioned earlier on. We will come back to the phone lines, but we have Chief Abofrebo back on the line. Uh, Chief, uh, while you were away, Sean and I talked about the 774,000 uh, jobs scheme. 
Um, the federal government wants to run a public works program to keep people employed for three months due to COVID-19. But the National Assembly isn't satisfied with the selection of stakeholders. They want the National Directorate of Employment to handle the recruitment directly. According to the laws and to best practice, just like I asked you, What's the right way? What's the right way? State committees or NDE? Sheung says NDE. Do you agree? Yeah, hundred percent. Sheung was right. Uh, let me let me start by saying NDDC cannot stop me from talking. We have <laughs> off my network. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, clearly, um, you know, the straightforward way to do it and the transparent way and the less corrupt way, if you want to call it that, hmm. is through the NDE. That's why the NDE exists. It's mm. the entire reason that mm. is to be there if in situations like this. The the NDE is it was, it was set up by IBB and it's meant to be um, sort of like have a repository of every Nigerian who needs a job and every job that needs a Nigerian. Mm. And you know it's supposed to have the records of all of that so that one day government wakes up and says, you know what we we have one thousand jobs in every LGA who do we fill them with? NDE is supposed to be the government's first port of call. Hmm. And NDE will say, okay, in this local government, in Etiosa local government, okay, if it's um, construction you want to do, we have these 2,000 people who are fit for construction work. Hmm. And then it's a blind, trans it's a blind, transparent process hmm. of selecting those ones based on criteria, priority, age, gender, whatever it is, but hmm. whatever has been set down. But when you now say, instead of that, you now bring a committee and a committee of quote unquote stakeholders mm. stakeholders who are not in the public service mm. who are you know from you know ngos or um you know organizations or pressure groups and interest groups and you bring them there they are not labor professionals what are they going to do they're going to divide those 1000 jobs based on personal interest mm. then that's when you now start to hear that very um often use Nigerian word used in Nigerian politics, slots. And uh, for these 774,000, I get 10 slots. So, ah, chairman get 20 slots. So maybe we go beg and maybe he go put my daughter inside one of his slots. Mm. And it turns into a, a, a bonanza for those who play patronage politics. It becomes just yet another way for patrons to water their clients and for clients to seek favor from their patrons. Mm. And eventually... Then we wonder why the job doesn't get done because what ends up happening is you give you give the um, the job to somebody like me who has no intention of going to grade a road. Mm. So I will just sit down in my house and collect my twenty thousand every month, and then we wonder why at the end of the three months nothing got done. Mm. Lagos, if you just joined the show, how do we end corruption in government contracts and hiring? I've got Shen Wonig being there on the show with me. He's a founder and CEO of Budget. I also have on the show a former M&E consultant, both for various governments and the World Bank, Chief Andy Oboforibo. We're going to continue this conversation in a bit. Tweet at us at Nigeria Info FM. Share your thoughts via Facebook. Facebook is Nigeria Info 99.3. We've got WhatsApp, so send us a WhatsApp message. Why don't you? WhatsApp is uh, 080 959 75805. Have you ever bidded for a government contract? Um, what's your experience with government contracts or government job recruitment? How do you think these things can be improved? How do you think they can be made more transparent? I'm Sandra Ezekwasili. It's 25 minutes past five. Hard, hard facts. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Hard Facts with Sandra Ezekwisi. How do we end corruption in government contracts and hiring? I'm Sandra Ezekwisi. You're listening to Hard Facts. Now, the NDE is supposed to do three main things, right? to design and impl- to design and implement programs to combat mass unemployment to articulate policies aimed at developing work uh, programs with labor intensive potentials to obtain and maintain a data bank on employment and vacancies in the country with a view to acting as a clearing house to link job seekers with vacancies in collaboration with other uh, government agencies. And so you 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 notice that number three. I, I, I want to ask a question about number three, and I'll come to Sean. I, I have Sean Onigmide on the show with me. He's the CEO and founder of Budget. I also have a former M&E consultant uh, for both uh, various governments in Nigeria and the World Bank, Chief Andy uh, Oboforibo. And they've both been, you know, walking us through this conversation. Xiaong, if you look at number three on what the NDE is supposed to do, it means that the NDE is already supposed to have a database of people who need work. So why is it that now that we need that database, NDE doesn't have it? I mean, NDE's database cannot be in isolation. I mean, and and when we, when the, the intention of those who draft these things is not for NDE to, you know, it's not for NDE to be asking, are you employed or not? Employed? And you can, and we can look at, we can bring a reference to the United States here. People who are out of job. And so there's a conversation between the employer, the employee and the government that I have fired this guy or I have uh, retrenched this guy. And is now suddenly the person has the capability to now file for unemployment claims, and so that's the framework that ND is supposed to get the the, the, the data for for people to just say that. And you know, you find that, that if you have a private sector job and say we need hundred people to apply for this skill level, you might possibly get five thousand or six thousand. The government says we want seven hundred thousand people. You will be shocked that when that job will be thirty thousand, four million people will be applying. Not because the 4 million people need the job, not because 30,000 have missed a lot to them, but because this is the free for all opportunity. And this is my own opportunity to deep, to get my own national cake. Okay? And at the end of the day, we know that this is government job. Nobody, no one will be appraised for anything. I mean, and that's the problem that the lack of a comprehensive and structured citizen database is a big problem in Nigeria. And we cannot become a developed society without fixing at least two stuff. First, you have to face a citizen database. I mean, your driver's license, and we have said this a lot of times, your driver's license, your housing documents, your bill, your mortgage system, your credit system, your international passport, your voting document, every single thing is connected to this single reference data. United States has it, social security. The UK has it, national insurance number. The, even Ghana has it, even South Africa has it. The Kenyans have done one recently called Uduma. Every country is trying to build a structured and comprehensive database. The second thing is an addressing system. No matter where you live, no matter how, how the, the slum or wherever you live, you must be able to, letters, documents must be able to get to, to, to you. I mean, and that ultimately able to resolve all of that. We can't even say this is who is employed or not employed. And that's the same problem we had when the coronavirus or COVID-19 crisis started. We wanted to give palliatives to people. But what do we give the palliatives? Because there's no structured database to understand who's poor, who's the what, who, who are the which part of the poorest, poor of the poorest, or poorest of the poor. I mean, who are the most vulnerable people? Who are the people that could still manage in the current crisis that we have right now? There is no factual evidence of that. So those are the kind of questions that we have in this institution that ND have remained incapacitated for too long mm. because we have failed to do basic things. When Sharon was talking, Chief of Offer, you were nodding along. So you agree with uh, what he was saying? I mean, it's, it's very hard to disagree with that. I mean, the data problem is, is, is massive, especially when it comes to identity, identifying locations and identifying people. And like he said, that's the first step. Before You have to know who is there and where they are. 
before you mm. can start talking about whether they have a job or they don't have a job mm. or whether you know how you know you, you have to have these basic things but you know um you know data is inconvenient in nigeria mm. so we um, those who can collect the data do their best not to collect it it's you very know, interesting that you say that. it like that data is inconvenient tell me why you say that well, data is very inconvenient i mean because the thing with data is it tells you and it tells everybody else whether you're doing your job or not hmm. and if you are ha you have a vested interest in not doing your job while taking the money for doing <laughs> the job um the last thing you need is uh you know pesky data snitching on you so you, you basically you're you're trying your best to like you're like stop 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 paying attention to what i'm doing and that's pretty much the way government has run in this country for the last like 50 years hmm. you try your best to suppress the data as much as possible let this thing not come out i mean earlier on sandra you were i was listening um, to your show on my uh, as i was driving home and you, you were talking about the cross river state um situation hmm. that suppression of data and it's it's basically like the job of government almost uh to hide data from nigerians and not collect data in and then it's the job of Nigerians to force governments to actually look at the data. But when it comes to like the NDE, the NDE has also been woefully underfunded ever since it was ever since it came into existence. I think it, 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 NDE was set around 1990, I think. Uh, you know, but I don't think NDE, and I think Shehu can can speak to that better than I can. But I don't think NDE has ever gotten the budget that it it actually. Um, listed to get in a, in a budget because mm -hmm. it's one of those perpetually underfunded agencies and then okay so you have a situation where the ideal is what she would describe where you know there's a tripartite and sharing of data between employer employee and the and the government and these things are supposed to be triggered it's supposed to be like sort of like a a, a push notification when mm -hmm. you're let go the, you, you, the information is passed on your pink slip you carry it and you move on to the next place but let's say we don't have that. Let's say we are just not set up for that, right? The old way that they were doing in places like America, like during the Great Depression was, there was an unemployment office. And if you're unemployed, you just walked down to the unemployment office and said, hey, I'm unemployed. And they put you down on the list. But let me ask, and I'm sure you can ask your, your callers when they call, does anybody know where the NDE's offices are? Like, has anybody ever seen an NDE office? You know, so when you have the government agencies responsible for a particular thing, and they have zero presence in the lives of people, I'm sure before this 774,000 matter came up, hmm. most Nigerians did not even know that the NDE existed. <laughs> Let's talk to Lagos. 0700 993 What's your experience with government contracts or with government job recruitment? How do you think that these things can be improved? What do you think of what my guests on the show today are saying? I've got... Uh, uh, Chief Andi Oboforibo, who is uh, a former M&E consultant, both for various governments and the World Bank. And I also have Shion Onigbinde, who is the founder and CEO of Budget. Ruben is in Yaba. Hello, Ruben. Thanks for calling. Yeah, yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, I like the question one of your guests asked. Mm. That, um, is there, where is an ND office? Mm -hmm. Around your area, mm -hmm. I live around the Unilag area, and there is the, there is an NDE office in my place, in my area. If I opposite my street, like I'm seeing it right now, in my you know, opposite, opposite my street. That's good. It's the most useless place you can ever be. Like the only time you if I go to NDE is when I want to be, you go to NDE, maybe you want to go and buy Amala, or you want to go and do photo coffee. <laughs> okay. There is no, there is no this understaff. Most of the people there are just <laughs> there, nothing. The only time that place is active, maybe they want to do marriage ceremony. It's the most useless, useless place to be all around Onike, Akoka, Yaba area. <laughs> so that's what we are saying. Okay. Look at NDE website. It's the most useless website you ever. Nothing there is clickable. Take anything there. It's just standing there like a statue when you, when you, when you, when you, when you try to check it. So this is part of what we are saying. Hmm. Ruben, thanks for calling me and giving me the eyewitness account about how you can buy Amala. 
uh, at the ND <laughs> office in Yaba. Daniel, hello. <laughs> Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm calling from Ojo. Yes, Daniel. Is there an ND office where they sell a mala in Ojo? I don't really know any office in Salamala, but I know the office is office. You know what? The office don't exist. Okay. Tell me why you've called us today. I called because I've got my experience listening to the government jobs of it. Good. Okay. I've been trying to fill government documents. I've got an ex. A document relating to um, pre prison employment into the enrollment into the prison service. So okay. This I should bring like seven hundred thousand naira, which I don't even have. Hello. Uh, ah, you should bring seven hundred thousand to be a prison I, worker. Yes. How much is your um, salary? That, How much is the salary of the prison worker? That is what I don't even know. Because when I even finished my school since 2009, I've been filling government jobs forms every year, but they've not called me for one. Mm. It's quite the thing, Daniel. I'm sorry you had that experience, but thank you for sharing that experience with me on the show today. We've got uh, more people calling in. Hello. Hello. How are you, sir? What's your name? Uh, I'm fine. My name is Noble. Can you speak up? We're struggling to hear you. My name, my name is Noble. I'm calling from Isolo. Welcome, Noble. Yeah, I they, they, I have not done government job once, but uh, I work with the person that has done government job. Oh, fantastic! And then at the end of the day, before the job goes to him, he passed through about four people, which they splitted the, the, at the eighth stage. He collected their own share before reaching down to him. And I noticed that when he was doing the job, he made a lot of money. So I was wondering if he should get a government job that cross about four people before getting to him. Then how much is the contract? Meaning that the contract was so inflicted that to the extent that even after the job, he was able to buy a car, bought a land, and then, you know, do things amazingly. So, government contracts in, in this part of the world is just too outrageous. It's just too something we, you can't talk about. And I, again, I, there's a contract I did with somebody, with former uh, enemy, when it was enemy, this, um, uh, this um, shipping company. The very thing they asked us to fix, that was the very thing in that same building. They were not bad, so we removed those ones and fixed another one. Even the ones we fixed, they are more inferior to the ones they already, something like aluminum partitions and the boards. So, just a means of, you know, eating the money, it's just a means of siphoning the money. Mm. That's uh, my experience. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you for calling to share it with me, I appreciate it. My last call is Tony, who's in Festac. Tony, hello. Fine. Good evening, Sandy. Good evening, Sandra. How good are you? Fine, fine. How is work? Good, 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 good. Go ahead. Getting, getting anything called job or contract from the government is, in fact, is like looking for visa to heaven. There is no kind of prior that I have not done, having graduated since 2005. Nothing, no headway. See, Auntie Sandra, hmm. Ike Nigeria, Agulam. Let me just talk for other people to call. Tony, thanks for calling me. Ike Agunagi, Ike Agunagi, Biko, Biko, Biko. We've got Tindu Beza from Ojudu Beja who says, this is your question. It's like asking, how do we stop the rain from touching the ground? We cannot stop corruption in government contract award. Rather, we can reduce it. This is because there's no mechanism in place to punish or bring people at high places to book except when such a person falls out of favor. Also, if the head of the fish is rotten, the whole body of that fish will be rotten as well. Shen, would you agree that there's no way to stop corruption with uh, these things and the only thing we can do is reduce it? Okay, uh, I mean, I would not, I, I would stop corruption in procurement. There is a way to minimize it. Um, I will, and I would not say, I'm, and, and it's about ethics, it's about morality, and it's about how we understand what public funds are. Hmm. Public funds are a sacred are sacred items that are kept in trust of the people, some people, mm. you know, uh, and they have to make sure that they manage those trusts well. But the way we treat public funds, I mean, is like it's a free for all. And I'll make an example of this budget. We are a non-profit organization. We get funds from maybe USAID or, or uh, once in a while. The intense, the intense scrutiny that uh, we face now those funds are managed, you would not believe it. Just because we're talking about tax 
dollars. I mean, taxpayers' money maybe at this point. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, the public funds have to be optimized for, because they are not, they are, they are finite. It's not an infinite commodity. There's a limitation to how much money government has. And that's to be optimized for the people. So for me, ending corruption in public office, there has to be deterrence. People who have taken, look at the NS, look at the whole madness happening with the NSITF now. You know, there were people who, they practically, as I read in the papers, they practically took contracts and they broke them into chunks and into pieces so that they can contract those things and they called up them consultancies. You have amounts running to the billions and you're calling all of that consultancy. And that's, and there's so many, there are so many examples of that across the board. But the only thing is that they have to be deterrent. People go to 20, 25 years jail. Let that happen. Hmm. People get to lose their honor and are not able to get any form of honor in any way because they did that. Let that happen. Hmm. You know, but in this situation when they get mixed in you know, a long winding um, judicial system that goes nowhere, then there's no way we're gonna ever get to stop doing this. So I believe that it is you give a contract to someone because he deserves it. Not because there's a, a, a benefit to you. As long as that keeps happening, we can't draw the lines. And we can't draw the lines not even about the delivery. We can't even draw the lines about the quality. Mm. Mm. Because people now say, just look at the psychology. I'm a contractor. This contract is 100 million naira. You've taken 60 million naira from me because we have to settle around the whole. I'm also thinking about how much money of this can I put in my own pocket. Not that the goal no more longer is, to deliver, is not to deliver things for the public. And these are the situations you find. Look, at the NDD has almost a trillion naira of abandoned projects in terms of value in Nigeria. Why? Public contracting. Everybody just have values projects. The new guy comes, he doesn't care about it. The same thing we have at the federal government level. I mean, these things can't put, we can't get results this way. We have to be disciplined. And we have to focus on revenue optimization. And the only way we can do that is let's pay attention to public contracts. Hmm. And the government is not sincere. There's no there's no sincerity in the fight against corruption without fixing public contracts. And the answers are clear. There's what they call open contracting. The organizations like the public private development center, PPDC, that has been on this conversation for close to six years. Let there be a portal. Every Nigeria that is pre-qualified should be able to apply for. So that there's a competitive level of how much how much will a classroom block be delivered. How much will this way can be procured? There should be a standardization of that. It should be made much more pure, open. And when you be, then there should be a com quality control mechanism. All of that in that process. But we have had open contracting mechanism on by that NGO has been pushing it. The government of Jonathan did not, did not find interest. The current government by Gwari has also been implementing it in piecemeal. No one wants to move forward in a significant or a bold way with it. And that's what we have as a continuous cycle. And that's why you hear government says, oh, we have spent 1.3 trillion naira on capital expenditure. Then you say, which capital expenditure? Because a quarter of that is administrative capital expenditure in conferences, meetings, and, you know, and buying of or ELOX vans. The another a quarter of that is stolen and it's in the pocket of private politicians. You know, that's the same situation. I ask myself, what? I mean, I could keep going on and on. Let me just stop. <laughs> I mean, because it's so, so but, but then, but, but it's, it's interesting that you've mentioned government, you've mentioned the NDDC. I want to pivot uh, to right here in Lagos. Uh, Chief of Bofuribo, Loma says that it's in the middle of an audit of the system. Tackers and keepers for Loma. First of all, let's get it out of the way. Is it normal for government to hire private contractors for sanitation and waste management? Is that normal? Chief Oferbo. Yeah, it, it happens. It happens in some places. Like at any time it happens, you always have some sort of racketeering going on. Hmm. So, like famously in the United States, um, places in the East Coast, especially, this is like New York, New Jersey, Philly, Atlantic City. Um, waste management was is what was and is contracted out. And so who took over waste management? The mafia, the, Italian, the Sicilian mafia. Hmm. They took over waste management in hmm. those places. Hmm. And because it, it, it's very lucrative and it's very attractive. So you tend to always have some sort of racketeering with waste management. Now, some in some countries, they make it, a, it's a municipal thing. And at the municipal level, it, the waste management is done by the government. Hmm. But in other places, it is contracted out. And there are pros and cons. Hmm. 
Okay. Now, Loma says it's in the middle of an audit of the system. And they are saying that there are lots of contractors who have inflated the number of sweepers working for them. Now, this is important because Loma pays them 25,000 naira per sweeper after agreeing on how many sweepers are needed. How could this inflation happen? Are, are there systems that uh, Loma should have put in place before the audit to make this impossible? Uh, is that for me? Yes, Obo Faro. Okay, yeah. I mean, see, this thing there, we're not in the 1800s, right? Mm -hmm. We're in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the time we do these things and it's really just for convenience. Hmm. Um, but now we have better technology. We have better, Okay, so let, let, before I even go to technology, let's come back to my, my former bread and butter, which was M&E. Hmm. Now, that's monitoring and evaluation. Lagos is made up of streets. Each street has a contractor allocated, um, assigned to it to, to make sure that that street, street is swept. Hmm. The contractor and Loma have sat down and agreed this particular street, Ikorodu Road, let me say, Ikorodu Road needs, I'm just throwing out a number here, a random number, um, 50 sweepers should be on duty in the morning and in the night. Let's mm. just say that, okay. right? Okay. Now, and they've had the same agreement with every contractor on every street. What stops Loma from conducting daily or even weekly random spot inspections? To make sure that, oh, Ikorodu Road. So, you don't know whether they are coming to Ikorodu Road. You don't know whether they are coming to um, Akia, um, um, to whichever street. They just show up and count. It's a very simple, low-tech thing. And if you, you have the right number of sweepers, you have complied. If you don't, you have not complied. Hmm. And you give them a set number of non-compliances. After that, you know, there's their penalties. Hmm. You do that... And you keep everybody in line. Hmm. But Loma failed to do that. You know, you okay, then oh issues of oh they're not paying the contract um, paying the sweepers. Why not pay the sweepers directly? I mean, yes, because you know that this thing is prone to corruption, prone to diversion of funds. Why don't you have them submit their list of um, um sweepers to you and then you vet them? Because there was also the issue of ghost sweepers, you know. A contractor says he has 100 sweepers on the payroll, hmm. but he only has 20. And they were saying, the Loma people were saying that when they got dead, they got to the scene, and when they were now checking them, oh, they were now seeing that one man had the phone numbers for, uh, one phone number was for 10 different sweepers and all those kind of things. Hmm. That's because at no point did Loma do a verification to ensure that, okay, this contractor actually has the 100 sweepers he said he has. Hmm. And these are, these are just the basic things, the low-hanging fruit. I've not called any technology or anything. So when you see that happening, hmm. you realize that it's not an accident. No be mistake. Hmm. It will, the, the system has been left intentionally lax so that the contractors can take money out of the system. And because, like, you know, um, so let me, let me, and if, if you don't mind, can I tie back to that previous question that the caller asked? Yeah. Um, the, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because, like, you know, like, how can we remove that? It's impossible. Because that, that was going to be my next question. Because you say that the system is left lax on purpose. How do we um, tighten the system? All right. So, here's how the system is supposed to work um, the, the executive and the legislature come together and create a budget. In the budget, there are projects and money is allocated to those projects. Hmm. The money is handed over to the executive. Executive runs a transparent process to select contractors, hmm. gives them the money, and monitors them as they work, hmm. while the legislature monitors the executive. And at the end, if the contractor fails to do his job, the executive is supposed to hold him, drag him to court, and all of that. But when the um, executive does not do so, if he has embezzled, the EFCC or some other independent prosecutor is supposed to come in and drag him to court. Hmm. But here's the problem. The politicians who are in the executive and the legislature, they both want the contractor to embezzle the money. They want the contractor to embezzle the money because they need that money in 2023. <laughs> 
now the 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 so-called independent prosecutor who is supposed to catch the contractor hmm. relies on those politicians to keep his job then let us go to the judiciary the judges are nominated and appointed by those politicians a lot of the time they are their relatives how many different times have you seen a judge who shares the same surname as a politician because politicians when they're in office appoint their relatives to the judiciary so now expecting any of these people to do the right thing and catch a corrupt contractor is like expecting a ram to declare that today is salah so what do we do a ram what can we do today is salah. what can we do what do we do what we do is we know what contracts are awarded. Mm -hmm. The only way we get this system to work is if the people take the information that people like Shane will give them through budget and start to say, you know what, mass action. Mass action is really the only way to get a system to work when all the people with power refuse to let the system work. And you say, look, this project was supposed to be done. It hasn't been done. We are not going anywhere until somebody is arrested. Until we, the people, are ready to do that, all of this is just talk. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. I know the time, the time, it always flies by when we're having great conversations. And there are so many parts of this conversation that I didn't even touch at all. But we've, we've got just one hour and we need to talk to Lagos as well. So, Shimon uh, Day from Budget, thank you. Uh, Chief Andy Obofuribo, thank you so much. Uh, Lagos, I'm going to go to Facebook and I'm going to go to Twitter and we'll take your thoughts. Facebook is Nigeria Info 99.3. WhatsApp is 080 959 75805. On uh, WhatsApp, the most baffling thing is that we were better off with corruption index when the country was not professing anti corruption mantra than now. What a paradox! Tony Anele says, Tony says that your guests are very correct. Don't even talk of data or documentation with any government office. They only share their jobs based on party patronage. Whatever they bring to public domain is a scam. All right, Tony Anele, thanks for sending your message in. Hi, Sandra. I have severally been turned down each time I tried to apply for a government job due to nepotism. I decided to advance my career by obtaining a PhD in one of the biomedical sciences but for five years now i'm still battling with unemployment the problem in nigeria is that if no one up there pushes your application it gets dumped nobody's interested in merit rather they will employ their unqualified relatives it's sad because i have given up on this country goodness from my papa says goodness don't check out don't check out we've got a limo show uh, uh Okay, this person is sending me the population of our limo show. I wonder why. Uh, we've got more comments here. Why should any serious organization uh, or government ask people to pay for application form? To me, that's official scam, pure and simple. Tony is in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Sandra, let's tell ourselves the truth. Once NDE gets hold of the recruitment process, the reps knows how to handle the NDE boss to get half of total numbers of the job slot into their custody and destabilize the entire objectives of the scheme. Nigeria is no longer a country that follows what is written on paper. The intention of the House Rep of the House of Rep is to hijack their own share of it. If not, there's no reason not wanting Festus Kayamo to speak in front of cameras and journalists. NDE themselves know that reps will request for their own cake out of it. And uh, by doing so, there'll be ghost workers on site while some are taking the money while sleeping. Nigeria, Tibaje, and it's the fault of these political fraudsters that we have on sit everywhere in Nigeria. No love lost here, huh? Okay, let's uh, take a look at Facebook. Facebook is Nigeria Info 99.3. I'm going to take just one comment and then we're going to wrap up hard facts for today. Lagos, you've been great. I love it when we have these conversations because you offer so much. I'm Sandra Ezekwasile, by the way, and uh, unfortunately, Facebook isn't behaving, so I can't take a look at Facebook for now. But I am back on your air tomorrow at uh, 3 p.m. 
join me for the big three. Uh, and then, of course, we've got Community you Report coming your way. I'm Sandra Ezekwesili on social media, so let's talk online. Why don't we? S. Ezekwesili on Twitter and S. Ezekwesili on Instagram. Until tomorrow, Lagos, those are your hard facts. Good night. Stay locked. Stay tuned to your favorite dial. 99.3 Nigeria Info. Let's talk. 99.3.